In the waning days of World War II, the world of military aviation was at a turning point. By the close of 1944, America's prop-driven B-29 Superfortress was pushing the limits of extended-duration bombing missions thanks to technological advances like its uniquely pressurized cabin and remote-controlled defensive turrets. On the other side of the fight, the Nazi Messerschmitt Ne-262, the world's first operational jet aircraft, was proving that the days of propeller-driven fighters were numbered. In a very real way, the future of warfare in the skies was so in flux that in the minds of many, just about anything seemed possible. At the onset of World War II, a number of British Royal Air Force units were still operating biplanes. By the end of the war, jet fighters were screaming across the sky in massive air battles for the future of Europe. The famed Supermarine Spitfire, so often credited with winning the Battle of Britain, offered its pilots little more than a floating reticle on the windscreen, and 15 seconds worth of ammunition if a pilot were so bold as to release it all in just one volley. As technology advanced, many aircraft were fitted with more powerful guns and more efficient engines. But dogfighting remained a close-quarters shootout, a far cry from the over-the-horizon missile engagements of today. The race for being the most technologically innovative country was more important than ever, particularly in aviation, as entirely new air forces were built from the ground up. Almost a million aircraft were produced worldwide for warfare, and even though the United States joined the war later than most of the other technologically advanced countries, they didn't want to be left behind to keep up with the new technologies such as jet power and flying wings. But it was that powerful belief that air warfare was changing that prompted a number of governments to pursue unique and original air combat ideas that, in hindsight, seemed downright crazy. One such program was Northrop's XP-79, better known as the Flying Ram or the Flying Chainsaw. They wanted to design something that had never been seen before. The XP-79 was at a time thought to be the answer. Its purpose was to attack enemy bombers at unusually high speeds by ramming into them without suffering any damage itself. Its unique shape and strong magnesium-covered armor would allow it to slice off the tails and wing from any enemy aircraft. The crucial battle for air superiority during World War II saw the secret development of many aviation technologies, but it would ultimately be brute bombing force that would pound Germany into submission. In the late stages of World War II, just as the odds were starting to favor the Allied forces, American bomber formations in Europe were frequently attacked by a new German rocket-powered jet, the Messerschmitt Me-163 Comet. And even though these small jets brought plenty of show and theatrics to aerial combat, they weren't very effective. Still, the American public marveled at the design and technology of these innovations and wondered when they would get a small fighter jet of their own. What they didn't know was that the U.S. Army Air Forces were already working with Northrop Corporation on a project of just that magnitude. The Northrop XP-79 was the brainchild of this ambitious project. Jack Northrop, who is one of America's most innovative aircraft designers, intended for it to ram into enemy bombers and split them open. The XP-79 was much smaller than its stealthy successors would be, with a fuselage built only large enough for a single pilot to lay down in horizontally, making this aircraft's first significant departure from common flying wing designs as we know them today. Northrop and his team believed that the pilots would be able to withstand greater G-forces if they were oriented in a laying position, and because the XP-79 was designed to utilize jet propulsion, the shift seemed prudent. Born in Newark, New Jersey in 1895, Northrop grew up in Santa Barbara, California. In 1916, Northrop's first job in aviation was working as a draftsman for the Santa Barbara-based Lockheed Aircraft Manufacturing Company. After the outbreak of the First World War, Northrop was drafted into the U.S. Army, where he served in the Army Signal Corps. Northrop served in the military for six months before Lockheed successfully petitioned for his return to work in the private sector. In 1923, Northrop joined Douglas Aircraft Company, participating in the design of the Douglas Round the World Cruiser and working up to project engineer. In 1927, he rejoined the Lockheed brothers in their newly founded Lockheed Aircraft Company, 
Working as chief engineer on the Lockheed Vega, the civilian transport monoplane with a tanky lever wing that produced unusually high performance for that period, and was also widely used by such pilots as Wiley Post, Amelia Earhart, and Hubert Wilkins. In 1929, he produced an all-metal monoplane with pilot and engine within the wing structure. Although this aircraft had booms to attach to the tail group, it was in fact the step towards the flying wing. In 1929, Northrop struck out on his own, founding the Avion Corporation, which he was forced to sell to the United Aircraft and Transport Corporation in 1930. In 1932, Northrop, backed by Donald Douglas of Douglas Aircraft, founded another company, the Northrop Corporation, in El Segundo, California. There, he worked as chief engineer, and he helped design the A-17 attack plane for the Air Corps, as well as the BT-1 bomber for the Navy during the Great Depression. This company built two highly successful monoplanes, the Northrop Gamma and the Northrop Delta. By 1939, the Northrop Corporation had become a subsidiary of Douglas Aircraft. So Northrop founded another completely independent company of the same name in Hawthorne, California, a site located by Moy Stevens, one of the co-founders. While working at this company, Northrop focused on the flying wing design, which he was convinced was the next major step in aircraft design. His first project, a reduced-scale version tested in 1940, ultimately became the giant Northrop YB-35. The Northrop XP-56 Black Bullet a welded magnesium fighter was one of the more significant of his World War II designs. Along with the Northrop P-61 Black Widow, the first American night interceptor, of which more than 700 were constructed, his inventions continued into the post-war era of jet aircraft to produce the Northrop F-89 Scorpion all-weather interceptor. The Northrop YB-49 Long Range Bomber the Northrop Snark Intercontinental Missile and Automatic Celestial Navigation Systems. He produced a number of flying wings, including the Northrop N1M, Northrop N9M, and Northrop YB-35. His ideas regarding flying wing technology were years ahead of the computer and electronic advances of the fly-by-wire stability systems which allow inherently unstable aircraft like the B-2 Spirit Flying Wing to be flown like a conventional aircraft. The Flying Wing in the pursuit of low-drag high-lift designs were Northrop's passion and its failure to be selected as the next-generation bomber platform after World War II, and the subsequent dismantling of all the prototypes and incomplete YB-49s were a severe blow to him. He believed that such a jet with a single airfoil surface would have the most effective lifting capabilities. The lack of a fuselage and tail unit would mean less drag to affect overall performance and lower production costs. In his mind, it was a win-win. In 1942, Jack Northrop proved himself to be well ahead of his fellow American competitors and previous employers when his flying wing concept took a dramatic step forward. He convinced the United States Army Air Forces that he could build a flying wing fighter jet that could fly faster than the speed of sound. In January 1943, a contract for two prototypes with designation XP-79 was issued by the United States Army Air Force. Northrop's program began in 1943 with the code name Project 12 as its aircraft designation. It would have to be developed with the utmost secrecy as spying eyes could steal the advanced technology. Their plan was a rocket-powered flying wing designed with a total wingspan of only 32 feet. It would also be less likely to be spotted by enemy radars. Such a flight mission was not by the faint of heart. Experts believe that since the fighter's layout was so revolutionary and new, test bladder prototypes had to be built to verify the validity of the concept. Given the Northrop designation NS-12, the gliders were also given project numbers from the USAAF. Confusingly, two project numbers were used, one MX-324 when discussing secret aspects of the power gliders, and another MX-33 fear relating to the aircraft being built and flown as pure gliders. The NX-334 emerged as a flying wing glider with no tail surfaces. 
similar in layout and construction to the Northrop N9M. Completed in late spring 1943, the number no. 1 MX334 was tested in NACA Langley's wind tunnel, after which a large wire-braced fin was added to ensure directional stability at high speeds. For a more comprehensive test, a Lockheed P-38 Lightning was used to tow the aircraft on its first proper flight on the 2nd of October 1943. It had a tricycle undercarriage, which ensured a level floor when the aircraft was at rest. The power plants were designed to be placed deep into the fuselage aft. The development of the Aerojet's rocket motor lagged behind. In an effort to get in step with the program, that is, to meet its contract obligations and actually get a rocket-powered aircraft into the air, Aerojet built a smaller interim 200-pound rocket motor, the XCAL 200, fueled by monoethyl aniline and nitric acid. The rocket fuel burned quickly, and a flight time of just under four minutes was estimated, although the performance wouldn't be enough for a production model. The installation of this motor meant that the glider number would only now serve as a powered air vehicle for the P-79 program under the MX-324 program. Following the crash and complete destruction of the glider, the number two glider stepped up to become the powered MX-324. Testing with the rocket motor commenced on the 22nd of June 1944. With the first air tow launch for a powered flight on the 5th of July 1944, making it one of the first US built rocket powered aircraft to fly. Adjacent to the NX 324's development was the Northrop XP 79. This model was of greater military value, as it was designed to compete with the German Messerschmitt ME-163 Comet. Originally, just as with the MX-324, it was to be rocket-powered, and it also required a pilot lying prone in the cockpit. The XP-79 was to be able to reach speeds of 500 miles an hour, and the cabin would be pressurized to ensure the survival in the estimated 40,000 feet ceilings. In contrast with the authentic flying wings, the XP-79 design had a large swept wing surface paired with vertical tail fins at the rear for extra stabilization and maneuverability. Aerojet was never able to overcome the limitations of the XCAL-200 rocket tested with the MX-324. Instead, Westinghouse was chosen to deliver a pair of new turbojet engines, each of these 19Bs would generate 1,150 pounds of thrust. The cockpit was at the center of the triangle's apex and straddled on either side by twin intakes to aspirate the twin engines. The undercarriage had four landing gear legs and one-fourth arrangement instead of the more conventional three-legged form. The armed force's most fundamental requirement for this project was that the new flying wing would be able to ram into enemy bombers. The Germans had aircraft utilizing similar concept already in battle. Even though these yielded mixed results, America wanted the tactic in their arsenal as well. It was an approach that, by modern standards, now sounds delusional. After the testing period finished, the XP-79 was supposed to fly out from nearby Allied air bases against incoming enemy bombers. In practice, the XP-79 would launch from nearby Allied air bases against a flight of incoming enemy bombers. It would have launched quickly through the use of rocket boosters and reach high altitudes within minutes. With no armament intended for the design, the XP-79 pilot was expected to make several high-speed passes through enemy formation and utilize the reinforced wing leading edges to effectively slice through the airframes of enemy bombers themselves. As the XP-79 would have moved at such high speeds, enemy gunners could theoretically not target and fire upon the aircraft within time, so very little danger was apparent to the XP-79 pilot, aside from the fact that he was expected to ram his exceptional aircraft into the enemy. An armored glass mounting at the cockpit would protect the pilot's head and face during dives, while the body would be covered in heavy gauge magnesium armor plating, to mitigate the damage while ramming into enemy aircraft. However, 
By 1945, the XP-79 was being readied for a kind of metal that no longer existed. Fear of Hitler's bombers reached their greatest heights in the Battle of Britain. But further Luftwaffe bombing formations never materialized into the mid-late war years. As the prospect of facing off against wave after wave of German bombers subsided, the XP-79 mission profile became a moot point. Among the USAAF brass, someone must have recognized the absurdity of that idea, because the XP-79B order also stipulated that the fighters should accommodate 450 caliber Browning machine guns outboard of the jet engines. Neither the guns nor the cockpit pressurization system were destined to be installed in the plane. The airframe used to create the XP-79B was formerly the number 3 XP-79, since it could be more easily converted into a turbojet-powered air vehicle rather than a rocket-powered air vehicle. The first flyable XP-79B was painted white and was given the serial number 43-352437. It was struck to the Maroc Dry Lake testing facility in preparation for its first flight. Its first ominous taxiing tests were conducted in June 1945 during which all of the tires burst on at least several occasions. The flying chainsaw later actually had only one flight test, which lasted less than half an hour and ended with disastrous consequences. Northrop chose test pilot Harry Cosby for the flight test. On the morning of September 12, 1945, Crosby taxied out and lined up for takeoff. He powered up the plane's two Westinghouse Electric Corporation Model 19B engines to begin his takeoff roll and, at about 120 miles an hour, rotated the nose landing gear wheel and lifted off from the dry lake bed. At first, the unique, semi-flying wing piloted by Harry H. Crosby performed well. Then, about 15 minutes into the test, the twin turbojet-powered XP-79B went completely out of control. The craft entered a steep vertical spin and crashed on the ground, where it burned completely, fueled by the highly flammable magnesium metal of its body. At the first sign of trouble, Crosby, who had been piloting from a prone position, struggled to escape. He managed to remove the escape hatch above his head, but the 38-year-old Crosby, most likely not unconscious by the wildly gyrating air vehicle, was bucked out of the cockpit. He fell to his death with his parachute still packed. After the crash, Northrop's founder and president issued the following statement. The takeoff for this flight was normal, and for 15 minutes, the airplane was flown in a beautiful demonstration. The pilot mounted confidence by executing more and more maneuvers of a type that would not be expected unless he were thoroughly satisfied with the behavior of the airplane. After about 15 minutes of flying, the airplane entered what appeared to be a normal slow roll, from which it did not recover. As the rotation about the longitudinal axis continued, the nose gradually dropped, and at a time of the impact, the airplane appeared to be in a steep vertical spin. The pilot endeavored to leave the ship, but the speed was so high that he was unable to clear it successfully. Unfortunately, there was insufficient evidence to determine the cause of the disaster. However, in view of his prone position, a powerful electronically controlled trim tab had been installed in the lateral controls to relieve the pilot of excessive Gs. It is believed that the deliberate slow roll may have been attempted and that during this maneuver something failed in the lateral controls in such a way that the pilot was overpowered by the electrical trim mechanism. The USAAF accepted the number 1 XP-79B on a crash delivery basis in December 1945. An action was taken in January 1946 to terminate the remaining phases of the P-79 program, which had been an extremely advanced program for the era. The remaining unpowered MX-334, Blighter 1, did not survive, and its final disposition remains unclear. The Northrop Aircraft Corporation XP-79 program led to the first piloted flight of a rocket-powered aircraft in America. The XP-79B was unique in its semi-flying wing design and prone position of its pilot, as well as the floor point landing gear arrangement, twin vertical tails, and Delos-type flight control system attached to either tip of its wing. 
In addition, its body was constructed from magnesium alloy rather than aluminum alloy. Unfortunately, America's first rocket man, Harry H. Crosby, was lost during the XP-79B's first and only flight. With this tragic loss and the demise of the XP-79B, no replacement was ordered. Northrop and his engineers determined the XP-79 control problem could be fixed for the next test. Still, the US Air Force didn't want to risk any further disasters, so they decided to abandon the project. World War II was over anyways, and more conventional jet designs were already entering production. The techniques used to create the XP-79, however, aided in the development of other future projects. Northrop's obsession with flying wing designs finally came true when he developed his B-35 and B-49 bombers. October 4th, 1941. Incredible as it may seem, these crates mark the start of the development of the first jet engine in America. They contained an experimental engine which was flown to the United States from Great Britain under great secrecy in the fall of 1941. This flight was the direct result of a conference in the Washington office of General Arnold a few weeks earlier. Here was the actual beginning of the jet story in America. Gentlemen, I'll give you the Whittle engine. Consult all you wish. Arrive at any decision you please, just as long as General Electric accepts a contract to build 15 of them. These were the plans of the first turbojet engine that had been successfully produced by any of the Allies. They were the results of a long, hard struggle by England's group captain, Frank Whittle. He had worked toward jet propulsion in the face of many difficulties, and he had succeeded. The Air Corps felt that jet propulsion had tremendous possibilities and the British Air Ministry made all their information available to the United States. The men of General Electric knew from there with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics that the essentials of a turbojet were a compressor and a turbine. I cannot overemphasize the secrecy and the importance of this work. We know that both the Italians and the Germans are working on jets. I hardly need tell you that they must not win the race. General, given unlimited priority, we will have the first unit running on test in six months. Six unbelievably short months in all to plan, design, and build the first American jet engine for a revolutionary new principle of flight. Yet these men were able to make this promise to their government in time of war because actually this problem was not new to them. It really began on the campus of Cornell University in 1903, where a young mechanical engineer named Sanford Moss was working for his PAD. He was engaged in research for his thesis on gas turbines. He and his work had been consigned to this little building because there seemed to be a certain amount of noise connected with it. Not to mention smoke and odd smells. When he had completed his work at Cornell and received his degree, Moss went to General Electric, where he joined other experts and continued his work. Later, they set up a research department to study turbines of all kinds, 
as well as compressors, pumps, boilers, and related equipment. By 1918, Moss and his fellow workers had accumulated a tremendous amount of knowledge in relation to turbines and compressors, and as a result, he was called to Washington. There, the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics initiated work with Dr. Moss on a practical turbo supercharger, which the Air Corps hoped would increase the altitude performance of its World War I fighters. A gasoline engine runs on a mixture of air and fuel which burns in a cylinder. At higher altitudes, the atmosphere becomes progressively thinner so that the engine cannot get enough air to burn as much gasoline as it should for maximum power. The turbo supercharger simply adds a compressor to the engine which packs or charges the thin air into the cylinders. This allows the engine to burn more fuel and deliver full power. The compressor is run by a turbine which is turned by the exhaust gases of the engine. Moss's work on the turbo continued and his improvements had a tremendous influence on aviation. In 1920, the Army established a world altitude record of 36,000 feet, proving the turbo and air so rarefied that the pilot became unconscious and fell almost six miles before pulling out. General Billy Mitchell's famous test, which demonstrated for the first time the tremendous importance of air power, was actually made possible by Moss's turbos. Mitchell's plane had to come in at 15,000 feet in order to avoid theoretical anti-aircraft fire. To give a plane enough power to carry a 2,000-pound bomb at that altitude, Mitchell had General Electric turbos installed on new twin-engine Martin bombers, and the results made aviation history. interest in turbos was greatly intensified. They quickly became standard equipment on such outstanding aircraft as Republic's Thunderbolt, Lockheed's Lightning, Consolidated's Liberator, and old reliable, the Boeing Flying Fortress. The high altitude daylight strategic bombing operations which destroyed the strength of our enemy in Europe would not have been possible without turbos. They have contributed immeasurably to the science of flight and continue to do so. They are used on some of today's finest piston engine planes. The most formidable weapon the world has ever seen was carried by a turbo supercharged plane. So in 1941, with a new but related problem, it was only natural for the Air Corps to again turn to the same organization and ask them to build the first American turbojet. And build it they did. At a series of secret meetings one month before the arrival of the Whittle engine, the project had been started with a small nucleus of key personnel. These men picked those they wanted to work with. However, in most cases, they did not let them know what they were to work on. There were over a thousand men on the project but less than a hundred actually knew what they were making. Planning and assembly of the engine itself was segregated in an entirely separate building and heavily guarded 24 hours a day. Many of the parts were made in the regular supercharger department, but as a further protection, the project was called a new type of turbo and simply given another production number, Type I. All the vast resources of the company were thrown behind the project. The knowledge gained in years of production and design of giant turbines of every kind. The research laboratory for special metals. The experience gained in the manufacture and operation of thousands of turbo superchargers. And the vast store of knowledge of the consulting laboratories. During the actual design and manufacture under D.F. Warner, these great resources led to the modification and improvement of the Whittle engine. For example, the English had trouble with turbine bucket forgings because of the high temperatures involved. But it was an old story to these men, and their long experience with turbos hastened the solution to this problem. Also, the English impellers had been giving trouble because of cracking, but skilled craftsmen were already making hundreds of thousands of successful impellers 
for all types of superchargers. American techniques of rotor balancing were very advanced and contributed greatly to smoothness of operation. Yet in spite of the diversity in size of the operation, there was not a single failure in security. Today we realize even more fully than the pioneers the almost incalculable importance of that first American jet engine, the forerunner of the engines that power the military planes of today. Yet those early workers seemed to sense the true value of their work, and it brought them together. There was a wonderful spirit of common purpose, of cooperation between the people who did the work, Britain, our Air Force, and the men of General Electric. In this atmosphere, the engine grew at an unbelievable rate, until at last, the first engine, right on schedule, rolled under heavy guard into the test cell. Now they would see the results of six months of round-the-clock effort. But they would see much more than that. They would see the birth of the jet engine in America. They would see the first really radical change in air power since the Wright brothers' flight so many years ago. They would see the first faint beginning of a whole new era in the age of flight. That is, they would see it if the engine ran. Now all they needed was to see it fly. Meanwhile, under the same rigid secrecy, the Bell Aircraft Corporation had been designing, laying out and building the Aero Comet to be powered by the new engine. They too had performed miracles of production in a startling new field. I can't get used to working on a plane without a propeller. Neither can I. I hope it flies. There were a lot of other people who hoped it would fly too. From top brass to Joe Average Man walking along Main Street, USA. Of course, he wouldn't hear about this particular plane for two or three years, maybe never. But he's a guy who carries deep within him a hope and conviction that any plane America builds will fly. These are the original films of the first jet plane ever to fly in America. That first flight on October 1st, 1942, less than a year from the start of the project, jet propelled flight in America became a reality. They had gotten off to a flying start, but in a race, it's the stamina that counts. So everybody kept right on working. The original engine, the IA, delivered 1,400 pounds of thrust. It was soon followed by another engine with more power, the I-16 with 1,600 pounds of thrust. Then came the J-33 with 4,000 pounds of thrust, and the jet engine really came into its own. The first flight of the J-33 was in June of 1944 in a Lockheed F-80 shooting star, again less than a year from the start of the project. This outstanding plane set many records, such as coast to coast in four and a half hours, and became our first operational jet fighter. In order to get the jet industry moving, and in the interest of national defense, GE passed along its plans to other manufacturers. Allison Division began mass production of the J-33 engine to help meet production requirements of the F-80 Shooting Star. The British Whittle engine, and the first engines designed by GE, used compressors of the centrifugal type. In these, air enters the hub and is hurled radially outward. However, even prior to seeing the British engine, Work on an axial compressor had been started with the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. In this compressor, air flows in a straight line to the rear. The axial compressor increases the engine's efficiency and handles a greater volume of air without increasing the engine's diameter. Long-range research led to an axial flow J-35, which powered the Republic Thunderbolt. And the Douglas Skystreak, older at that time of the world's official speed record of 640 miles per hour. Eight of these powerful new jet engines were also used in Northrop's 100-ton flying wing and many other planes in the rapidly developing jet field. 
During these years of progress with land-based aircraft, the Navy had worked with the McDonald Aircraft Corporation and Westinghouse to develop the Phantom. Proof that problems associated with carrier-based aircraft were not beyond solution came with the Phantom's first takeoff and landing from an aircraft carrier. Meanwhile, a school was established at General Electric to train the people who would install, operate, and service their new GE jet engines. One of the courses given is simply a general familiarization with the principles of jet propulsion and the jet engine. Ever since man undertook the conquest of the air, he has had two primary considerations. First, the aircraft itself, and second, its method of propulsion. Needless to say, he has not always been successful. Sometimes the airframe itself has been unsatisfactory. At other times, the method of propulsion has lacked the necessary power. In this case, for example, it's extremely simple. While in this, it's so complex that it borders on confusion. Actually, the early attempts at propulsion by reaction were not associated with aircraft. And, as in the case of most of man's early endeavors, they led to some rather startling results. The principle itself is very simple. Newton's third law of motion states that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. For example, an ordinary rotary lawn sprinkler turns because of the reaction of the arm to the action of the jet of water. It does not turn because the water squirted out pushes against the air it would spin just as well in a vacuum. Similarly, the jet plane flies because of the reaction to the jet. It does not fly because the jet pushes against the air behind it. The engine itself consists of two main rotating elements, the compressor and the turbine, which are both mounted on a single rotating shaft. Air is drawn in, compressed, and packed into the firing chambers where fuel is injected. The constantly burning fuel tremendously increases the energy of the enclosed gases, which rush through the turbine and out of the tail cone. The turbine, operating like a windmill, supplies the power to spin the compressor. The expanding gases pushing their way out of the rear at about 1,200 miles per hour give the plane its forward thrust. This, then, is the simple principle of propulsion which changed the whole outlook of the aviation industry. By 1951, GE's production models were delivering more than 5,800 pounds of thrust, a five-fold increase in 10 years. These engines are being mass-produced at both Lynn, Massachusetts and the great new Lockland, Ohio plant, the jet center of the world. Lockland represents more than huge production facilities. It represents a new production plan. Thousands of suppliers and subcontractors contribute to the manufacture of the jet engines which are assembled at Lockland. Thus, all sources of supply, down to the smallest individually owned machine shops, are benefited by the program and kept mobilized for production. The Lockland plan is truly another milestone. Just as the engines which roll from its production lines are the end product of many milestones. The result of almost 50 years of the best thought and effort of executives, engineers, scientists, and skilled craftsmen doing the work they are best fitted for in their own way. This freedom of effort is, after all, the real heritage of all Americans, and the engines are living up to that heritage. Today, General Electric turbojets are doing their job powering the great new planes they were designed for. Such planes as the Republic XF-91, high-speed, high-altitude interceptor. The North American F-86 D. The Martin XB-51 superfast tactical bomber. The North American Sabre, holder of the world's official speed record of 671 miles per hour and the 100 kilometer closed course of 635 miles per hour. The North American B-45 Tornado, the first operational jet bomber. Boeing B-47 Stratojet Bomber, which in 1949 flew non-stop coast to coast in three hours and 46 minutes. And the mighty Convair B-36, the intercontinental bomber, which is powered by six turbo-supercharged piston engines and four jets. These and others are the planes which must maintain the common security of the free peoples of the world and thereby ensure peace. And main... In 
one six-month period, three new GE engine designs were okayed for production, more powerful than the preceding one. The last of these is no larger than the model then in mass production, yet it delivers so much more thrust that it is not even in the same class. Even so, by the time any new engine is in mass production, still newer and better engines are on the way. Engines that will be a tribute to the life work of Dr. Moss, who died in 1946, one year after being awarded the Collier Trophy, aviation's highest award. Moss's work is finished, but there will always be others to carry on with new ideas. Perhaps we will travel from coast to coast in three or four hours of quiet, vibrationless comfort. Certainly our energetic and progressive aircraft industry will give us commercial jetliners as soon as the time is right. Even the atom may release its giant strength for aircraft. The Atomic Energy Commission, the Air Force, and General Electric are already cooperating on an atomic power plant for an aircraft to be built by Convair. NACA, the U.S. Navy's Bureau of Aeronautics, and a number of private corporations are also making real contributions to this program. Developmental engineering moves forward with great new facilities such as GE's Aircraft Gas Turbine Laboratory. Here engineers can simulate conditions for tomorrow's aircraft. Here men look ahead at the requirements of the planes of the future, requirements established by the product planners of the engine builders, of the airframe builders, and of the aircraft users. These are the molders of aviation progress. As long as imagination, research, design, test, and mass production continue year after year in a never-ending, constantly improving chain, there is no limit to the future of the aircraft engine. And so the jet story grows. In 10 years, we have come from this to this. No one can foretell the tremendous strides the aircraft industry will make in the next 10 years. Yet we can be sure that the engines will keep pace. The engines that are keeping and will always keep America strong.